once again, everybody, good evening. Welcome to our Sunday night prime time podcast here from Calvary Baptist Church in Gaylord, Michigan. The original broadcast date of this podcast is Sunday, January 23rd in the year 2022. This evening, we are going to have a discussion about something a little, <laughs> a little out there. I'm going to call this the isms that begin with the letter P. The isms that begin with the letter P. And you're going to say to me, what in the world is that? Well, very often there are false teachings that actually creep their way into otherwise biblical Christianity. And as the old saying goes, when you take truth and you mix it with error, you no longer have truth. Sometimes aspects of false teaching find a way to sneak into biblical Christianity, and it's so subtle that we can't even see it. You've heard me use a phrase about some fundamental Baptist churches that really ought to know better have had elements of teaching sneak into their theology that come right out of the charismatic movement. Not quite to the point of speaking in tongues, but a heavy, heavy emphasis on the emotions and then a, a willingness, perhaps unintentionally, a willingness to somewhat twist Scripture a bit in order to make it say what people want it to say. I see this in the Baptist movement, in particular uh, regarding revivalism, the misuse of altar calls, uh, the misuse of what's sometimes called decision theology, in which you really place way too much of an emphasis on our choice and nowhere near enough an emphasis on God's sovereign will. But that all being said, that is called Bapticostalism, in which good, solid biblical theology that's biblically based gets somewhat uh, invaded, almost, by other teachings that really are marginally biblical. Doesn't mean there aren't many saved, born-again believers in churches that have become Bapticostal. It just simply means that they have unnecessarily allowed certain elements in. Well, when we get around to the isms that begin with the letter P, as we now return from that real quick rabbit trail that, that gave you some context, these are things that are even more subtle, and yet their roots are very far from biblical Christianity. And one of the first of these isms that begin with the letter P is something called polytheism. Polytheism, P-O-L-Y. T-H-E-I-S-M. And polytheism, really, it's, it comes from the Greek word for many. It means poly, and theism is the Greek word for God, theos. Many gods. That's basically what polytheism means. It's one of the more dominant views in human history. The best-known example of polytheism way back in ancient times was the Greek and the Roman mythology. You know, the the Greek and the Roman gods. The Roman gods are those, those figures that our planets are named after. Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and Venus and Mercury and Uranus and Neptune. These are all the, the Greek gods, and these were the Greek and the Roman mythology. The clearest modern example, you know, today's example of polytheism would be the Hindu faith. As I understand it, they have identified over 300 million gods, lowercase g. 300 million with an M. I know, it's, it's unimaginable, isn't it? By the way, the Hindu belief is also essentially something called pantheism, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, it's interesting to notice that even the other world religions that are polytheistic one god usually reigns supreme over the other gods. For example, in Greek mythology, Zeus was the king of the gods. He was the head god. In Roman mythology, it was Jupiter. Now, some people argue that the Bible teaches polytheism in the Old Testament. You might say, say what? Well, I didn't say I agree with that, but there are people who try to make that argument. Now, the passages in the Old Testament that refer to God's lowercase g in a, in a plural sense, those do exist. Exodus 20, verse 3. People misinterpret this one a lot. 
thou shalt have no other gods before me. But if you understand the context there, it's referring to the making of idols. When you take something that becomes a god and it becomes more important to you than the one true god. So that's not polytheism. It's just simply referring to it on the surface. But ancient Israel understood there was only one true God. But they often didn't live as if they believed that to be true. They tended to fall into different forms of idolatry. Even the worshiping of those foreign gods, those pagan gods, they fell into elements of that. Particularly Jews who were from the area of Samaria. They intermarried with pagans, and so you ended up with uh, a, a mishmash of Baskin Robbins 39 varieties or whatever it was, Heinz 57 or anything you want to call it. Now something that I should add here is when we see passages in Scripture that speak of multiple gods, we need to remember the Hebrew word that was used for that, Elohim, was used to refer to the one true God. Okay, it's functionally identical to the English word God. Now, describing something as a God doesn't mean you believe it to be a divine being. The vast majority of the Old Testament scriptures, which speaks of gods, lowercase g, they're talking about false gods who claim to be gods, but they are not. Um, there's a pretty good summary of this in 2 Kings chapter 19. Verse 18, I'm going to paraphrase it a bit for you. They throw in their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they're not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by the hands of men. Okay? So I think the Bible pretty clearly teaches against this idea of multiple gods, polytheism. Many gods is what that means. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Psalm 95, 6. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The Lord made the heavens. You know, one of the things that it reminds us also, James 2, 19, when it says, you believe there's one God? Good. Good for you. Even the demons know that. And they quake. They shudder. But there's only one God. There are false gods and those who pretend to be gods, but there is only one true God. The idea of polytheism, many gods, is something that uh, is not a biblical concept. Now, let's go to another P. This one is a little, a little more out there. Pantheism, P-A-N-T-H-E-I-S-N. -E Pantheism is the view that God is everything, and everyone, and that everyone and everything is God. Now, just let that sink into you for a second. Pantheism has a similarness to polytheism, a belief in many gods, but it goes beyond polytheism. It basically says everything is God. To take it to an extreme, a tree is God, a rock is God. My doggy pepper is God. The sky is God, the sun is God. You are God. Pantheism is the, the basis behind numerous cults and false religions. Uh, to a degree, Buddhism, to a degree. Uh, some of the unity and unification cults are very pantheistic. Now, you might say, well, does the Bible, any aspect of the Bible teach pantheism? No. No, I don't think we can make that, that case at all. What many people confuse as being pantheism is a doctrine that we do support God's omnipresence, meaning that God is everywhere. He's at all places at all times, okay? Psalm 139, verse 7 to 8. And again, let me be sure that this is pulling up uh, our translation. Here we go. Psalm 139, verse 7 to 8. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. It's an interesting passage. God's omnipresence means he is present everywhere. There is no place in the universe where God is not. This is not the same thing as pantheism. God is everywhere, but he is not everything. 
Yes, God is present inside the tree, and God is present inside the person and inside the car and inside the dog and everything else that the pantheist thinks is God. But that doesn't mean that that tree and that dog and that car is God. Pantheism is a pagan belief. It is not a biblical belief. One of the stronger biblical arguments against any elements of this pantheism are the many, many, many commands against idolatry. The Bible forbids the worship of idols, the worship of angels, the worship of the stars or the planets, items in nature. If pantheism were the truth, then it wouldn't be wrong to worship an object like that because that object would in fact be God. If pantheism were true, worshiping a rock or an animal would be just as true as worshiping God as an invisible and a spiritual being. But you see, the Bible is pretty clear about this. And the Bible is pretty clear that idolatry is never acceptable to the God of the Bible. So we should never confuse the, the, the trait of God, the attribute of his omnipresence, meaning that he, there's nowhere that God isn't. That doesn't mean that everything is God. Okay? Now, here we get to the third P. And this one is even more subtle but it has woven its way into aspects of Christian theology. Not pantheism, but panentheism. P-A-N-E-N-T-H-E-I-S-M. Panentheism. You might say, what in the world with that? Well, essentially panentheism is a combination of the idea of theism, meaning there is a supreme being. There are many people who are theists. In other words, they're not atheists, meaning they don't they believe there is no God. Theists believe there is a God, not necessarily the God of the Bible, though. That would be somebody who is believes in theism. Okay? You combine theism with a God of some kind of a supreme nature, and you combine it with pantheism that God is everything. Basically, pantheism, remember it says God is everything, but panentheism holds that God is the supreme effect of the universe. To compare the two, pantheism says everything is God. Panentheism says everything is in God. Everything is in God. Now, I remember when I was... Uh, when I was growing up, and my dad introduced me to all those 1950s science fiction movies, most of those weren't just big bug movies. <laughs> you know, about a after an atomic war, and then you end up with gigantic creatures that are terrorizing people in small towns. <laughs> and that's what a lot of those movies were. But I remember watching one, and it was um, about the first the first space flight. This was made in 1950. They had no idea what they were doing. And they had to kill time during the trip there. And so, yeah, they blast off and they, they show the crew and they're talking. They're, they're eating lunch. And in the spacecraft, they're sitting down at a table and they're listening to the guy who is the captain of the ship. And he's the stereotype, you know, wise old professor. And they're talking about, gosh, it takes so long just to travel from here to there. I remember him saying, you know, there was a theory that once was advanced that the entire universe is just God, and all we're doing is just traveling from one molecule to another. That is classic textbook panentheism. Even back then in good old conservative 1950, um, philosophers love that stuff. I remember taking a philosophy 101 in college, undergraduate school. And, you know, and the prof would say something like that, and there was always one student who would say, oh, that's cool, yeah, I like that. And somebody else would say, oh, that's ridiculous. And the prof was trying to just keep the peace between those two by saying, no, 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 come on now, let's be respectful of each other's opinions. And he did a good job of trying to teach things that I don't think even he believed in, but he was his purpose wasn't to advocate for them, was to teach about what used to be thought. Well, panentheism is this third P. It says everything is in God. As the universe grows and learns, therefore God increases in knowledge and in being. 
pantheism is absolutely not biblical. Frankly, it's, it is extreme heresy. It impugns the character of God and makes him more like man. Scripture says God is present everywhere, but it doesn't say that God is everything. God knows everything, whether actual or even possible outcomes, but God doesn't learn because he already has all the knowledge. God is affected by things that occur in the universe, but only in that sin is what saddens him and angers him, and holiness is what pleases him. Our actions don't change God or impact his essential nature. Penentheism is the ultimate lower view of God. Now, the Bible presents God as holy, in Isaiah 6, 3 and Revelation 4, 8, presents God as sovereign over all things. I mean, many, many places. First Chronicles 29, 11, for example. Nehemiah 9, 6, Psalm 88, 18, Isaiah 37, 20. Let's take a look at Isaiah 37, 20. Isaiah 37, 20, where it says, Now therefore our Lord our God saves us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. Even thou only. So when we have these attributes of God, holy, sovereign, omnipresent, omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing, omnipotent, meaning he is all-powerful, self-existent, eternal, immutable. There's an attribute of God that we sometimes aren't sure what that one means. Immutable means he does not change. Perfect. God is perfect. God is infinite. None of these attributes, and I just touched the surface of attributes of God. I actually did a two-part sermon series about a year ago on the attributes of God. None of these attributes are are compatible with the idea of panentheism. God transcends all of his creation and in, is in no sense limited or changed by the events in his creation. Now, having covered panentheism and pantheism, let's go back to the first one, polytheism, many gods. Let me ask you a question, ask you to think about this. Are there religions today that look and sometimes feel like perhaps a variation of biblical Christianity, but in fact they are polytheistic. There are some very close friends that I used to have in Midland um, because these were good folks. These were good parents. They had great kids. And these folks were just as squeaky clean as you get. And, you know, I respect them a lot but they were part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And well, they don't see this about their faith, their understanding of God, if not being polytheistic, at least very much borders on it. They see Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and Satan for that matter, as being created beings separate from God. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, have elements of this too. They would say that Jesus is not God. He, If he is something, he is a lesser God. He may have been sent by God. But these are variations of polytheism. Now, the opposite of polytheism, well, I don't know if it's opposite, but the key difference is that Christianity is monotheism. Mono meaning one. One God. Monotheism. And there are actually three monotheistic religions in the world. One of them we came out of. Judaism is the second monotheistic religion in the world. They believe there is only one God. So you have Christianity and Judaism. But there is one other monotheistic religion in the world. And it may surprise you when I tell you which one that it is. They only believe there is one God. They have a very different understanding of who God is because their holy scripture, the Quran, describes a very different understanding of who God is. Islam, the Muslim faith, is also monotheism. 
They are not polytheistic. They don't think there are multiple gods. But their understanding of his nature and of his character and who his prophets are, are very different. That's why I don't accept the view that they say, oh, come on, the, the Muslims are praying to the same God that you are. And I would say, no, I don't think that they are because their understanding of who he is is being taught by a totally different holy book. Uh, Muhammad, their prophet, is not at all comparable to Jesus. And yet it is true, Islam speaks highly of Jesus and of his teachings, but they do not believe that he was the Son of God, nor do they believe that he is the Savior. But yes, it is a true statement that Islam, or the, you know, the Muslim faith, is monotheistic. Like Christianity and Judaism, they believe there is only one God. The other world religions are different forms of either multiple gods or some of those, um, the other two Ps, pantheism, meaning everything's God, or panentheism, meaning everything is in God. Now you might look at all of this and your head is spinning and you're saying to yourself, my goodness, Jim, how in the world do people think this stuff up? Well, they've thought it up for years. This isn't new. These things are all way back, way back to the time of the Old Testament. And a lot of it was because people are presented with, in fact, I would say even hit over the head <laughs> with biblical truth staring them in the face every day. The heavens declare the glory of God. Romans 1.20 tells us that God's made his, his very existence and his nature plain even within his creation, that we're without excuse. And yet, man has historically thought that he was so smart and so wise that he thought, oh, it can't be that. It's got to be something else. What very progressive Christianity does today, and I would use the word Christianity almost with a lowercase c or with question marks around it because it, it's losing its ability to claim that it is Christianity. When it's no longer holding to the idea that Christ is the only way, uh, then it is no longer Christianity. At that point, you have a variation of polytheism or pantheism because that tendency is very much there. But when they fall into that trap of saying essentially the following, well, back in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament in the first century, yeah, these, these things that they were taught and that are written in the Bible were okay because people weren't as developed then. They'll tell you, we've evolved. They'll say, we're smarter and wiser than we were back then. We, we don't need those old legends. They needed them then. We don't anymore. God has freed us from that, and we can now pursue higher order thinking. And they'll say all of that, and some of it sounds almost, uh, almost like they might have a point, but it overlooks something. You know what it overlooks? Is that we haven't evolved. That's the reality. If anything, we've degraded because since biblical times, there's 2,000 years worth of the effects of sin on not just our minds and our bodies, but literally on our souls, that we are more and more depraved. And as that happens, we become more and more prideful. We think we're so smart. We think that we are wiser than what we once were. I will give you this, we're more knowledgeable than what we once were. And a huge part of that knowledge, that explosion of knowledge, did begin starting in the time period called the Renaissance in the late 1400s. And then later on in the 1700s, what they called the Enlightenment. And yes, through all of those era, it was kind of a, a renewing of many of those ancient Greek philosophies, not all of which were bad. You've heard me say many times that there are way too many occasions in which conservative Christianity seems to think that the mind that God gave us is an evil thing, and therefore we need to just simply do whatever the guy with the suit on in the front of the church tells us. That's not conservative Christianity. It resembles Roman Catholicism. And so we, we really can't fall into that. We can't become anti-intellectual. We can't be anti-education. 
and some elements of conservative Christianity have kind of fallen into that black hole. But what we also can't be is think that we're smarter than we are, because we're not. We're fallen, we're depraved, and even in our saved by grace state, we still wrestle with these things. I think what we need to do is we need to look at Scripture and say, what does it say? And where it says things very straightforward and clearly, we need to cling to those, and those are the essentials. Those are the, the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And on those things in which there are some honest differences, we need to extend a sense of grace and Christian liberty to fellow believers. And those things today in churches show themselves in things like the understanding of what music's appropriate, what, um, uh, what dress is appropriate. Many forms of clothes that we wear can be modest. Men can wear things other than suits and ties, and women can wear things other than skirts and dresses and be modest. Even on the very emotional discussion of Bible translation, as you know, I do not support that King James only viewpoint. I think there are several good, solid, conservative translations, and there are also several that I could not recommend. Not because I think the people who did them are evil, but I think that they're pressing too much meaning into the translations. But all of these things here still fall within the range of biblical Christianity. But when you start adding those philosophies of polytheism, pantheism, and panentheism, and all of their modern-day variations, you get outside of the realm of Christianity. What happens is exactly what happened in the 1700s when those two weird German dudes, Schleiermacher and Kant, basically decided that they knew better, and their view of God was different than what Scripture said. They thought, we have evolved beyond those days. And so Schleiermacher envisioned a God that was so close, so imminent to us, but he wasn't all powerful. And Immanuel Kant said, no, 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 that's, that's not it. He's, he's so holy, he's so distant and remote that he's a little disconnected. In fact, every now and then he gets surprised by things because he wasn't watching all that closely. In both cases, they, they have lost what the Bible really says about God and they open the door to everything from polytheism to pantheism to panentheism. These are the false teachings that begin with the letter P. <laughs> what I would say is, let's major on the major and minor on the minors. Where the Bible is clear and black and white, let's find peace with that and accept that. And where there are some honest difference among conservative believing Christians, expect that those are going to exist and we're going to have a sense of grace with one another over a number of different things. Well, that's all that I have for this subject. I could carry on forever about it, but then I'd have to sell this, this podcast to the makers of Samanex, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I thank you for listening, as always. What I'm trying to do in these podcasts is to open our minds to recognize all the other views that are out there, not to teach them, but to teach how blessed that we are, that we have God's Word, but to also help us to have some knowledge so that we are equipped to talk with those people and to show them Christ's love and to do so in a way that's pleasing and honoring to God. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Have a great week. <laughs>